Let's imagine it's 2089. You're in a crowded city square and dozens of tiny remote nanosensors know it. They're detecting your heart rate, sensing your temperature, recognising your face. They're logging your blink rate, your iris response, your gait, even your neural patterns. And they're matching all that information at quantum speeds to databases almost infinite in scale and complexity. When you glance up high towards the translucent dome built to block out heat, pollution and storms, you can just make out a loitering aerial platform, mapping and monitoring the movements of the crowds. Suddenly, the dome bursts, the ground shakes, you turn to see thousands of airborne battle robots swarming towards you, energy weapons slicing through buildings and bodies alike. Now, don't worry, you survive. But what you saw won't really matter. Later, the authorities will reconstruct this moment to work out exactly who launched the attack and how it happened. All that data collected from sensors and devices that perceive, record and analyse the world in ways that humans can't grasp, that's what will decide what happened, why it matters and perhaps even what is to be done. What you saw, what you heard, what you felt will be just one microscopic piece of the puzzle. You, the survivor, the eyewitness, will be irrelevant because the act of witnessing, of constructing truth, of producing responsibility will have slipped beyond our grasp. Now, 2089 might look quite different to the picture I've painted, and I really hope it does. But one thing is certain, technologies that see, sense, track, record, store and analyse will have reshaped how we know things about the world around us, how we make truth, how we decide what matters. And that's huge. We're talking something about something fundamental to who we are. Think of the witness to a crime who, who tells the court what they saw. Or of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments etched in stone bearing witness to God. Or the millions who turned on their televisions to watch those planes fly into the World Trade Centre on September 11, 2001. Those acts of witnessing, of sharing testimony, are at the heart of politics, ethics, history, you name it. I'm a researcher in the School of the Arts and Media here at UNSW, investigating political violence and how we bear witness to it. Mostly, I look at culture, at books, films, art, to try to understand how we make meaning and how we make that meaning matter. And I also look at media technologies because they shape how we experience the world and how we make knowledge. I got interested in witnessing after 9-11. I was one of those millions who turned on the television to watch the towers fall. That had a profound impact on me, as did the war in Iraq and the torture at Abu Ghraib that followed. I was working as a speechwriter when Barack Obama was elected president. And the, one of the first things he did as president was declassify documents about American torture. I became fascinated. How could legal documents like this fully testify to what had happened? How could we, the people of the world, make sense of something as terrible as torture? What role would literature, poetry and film play in helping us understand? So I quit my job, did a PhD at Western Sydney University, wrote a book on torture and testimony, and I've been digging deeper and deeper into this connection between violence, culture and witnessing ever since. And that's led me to believe that there are three big reasons why witnessing matters. So first, witnessing makes truth. It might be partial, personal or deeply contested, but witnessing makes meaning that lays claim to truth. Second, because it produces truth, witnessing means becoming responsible to the event. It brings an ethical dimension to what has happened and it demands an ethical response. Third, because it creates responsibility, witnessing always happens in relation to other people. It's not just about what someone sees or hears, but about communicating that to others. So right now, I'm investigating how drones are changing how we witness the world, and war in particular. 
You all know what a drone is, right? That's a reaper, a rather different beast from those little quadcopters uh, that take photos at weddings or monitor beaches for sharks. But whatever their size, there's a few things we can say about drones. They're unmanned and remotely piloted. They depend on both complex sensors and very smart software to stay in the air. And they're networked and motile, which just means they move under their own power. That mix of qualities is what pushed drones from the margins of the military to reshape how war is fought today. Now, while America has the biggest militarised drone fleet, over 100 nations use drones for surveillance or combat, and that includes Australia. Last June, the Australian Defence Force ordered Triton MC4 surveillance drones, and in November, armed Reaper MQ-1s. Soon, we will start designing and manufacturing military drones of our own under the codename Project Wingman. And for years, we've been a crucial cog in the American drone war machine monitoring operations from Pine Gap. But we've had very little debate about any of this in Australia. Many of you in the room are probably hearing about it for the first time today. And even in places where there is debate, like the US or the UK, the focus is often on things like accuracy, just how precise are drone strikes? Or on strategy, are they effective at containing threats? Or on ethics, when should we use them? Now, those are really important questions, but I think there's other questions we need to ask too. You can hop on YouTube right now and see what an American drone operator sees from the camera of a Reaper drone, just like this one, piloted by crews located far from harm most likely at an Air Force base just outside Las Vegas, Nevada. You can even watch lethal missile strikes. The footage is usually thermal, tracking the heat of bodies and engines across grey-green landscapes. Somewhere in Afghanistan or Pakistan or maybe in Somalia or Yemen, a figure moves across a field or a car drives along a road. Suddenly, they are consumed by a flare of bright white that bursts and slowly fades. It's shocking, I think, to see such terrible violence inflicted on racialized populations by the world's most powerful military. And especially to see it in the mundane setting of YouTube, right next to cat videos and makeup tutorials. So who or what is witness to such an event? Is it the crew? in their air-conditioned ground, con ground control station, the military commanders or attorneys looped into the kill chain, the victims on the ground, their families and communities, us, watching long after the fact. Or is it perhaps the drone itself? Maybe we actually need to think of witnessing as a kind of network, composed like the drone system of technologies, people and processes. Now, we can zoom further out and ask, how will we witness war if war is increasingly fought by machines? How will we, the people, the citizens of nations, hold our leaders accountable for the things done in our name? And how will those subjected to war have any say in the matter at all? By 2089, war and everything else that we do, for better or worse, will be increasingly bound up with technologies that see, sense and process the world on our behalf. Remote sensors will be smaller, faster, more pervasive, more interconnected and more autonomous. Computational processing will occur at astonishing speeds. We might face a situation in which so much responsibility for, for bearing witness has been given over to non-human technologies that the foundations of ethics and politics are in crisis. That picture I painted earlier of killer robots and ubiquitous surveillance might be bleak, but something like it is all too possible. That's why I'm working to understand witnessing in a world dominated by drones, remote sensors, artificial intelligence and other technologies. I want to know what that means for the stories we tell, the truth we make, the ethics we live by. For those of you about to embark on your university careers, you too can ask questions about truth, ethics and the future, whether you're studying advertising, medicine, robotics or philosophy. Building the world we want in 2019 or 2089 isn't just about technology or policy. 
It's about deciding what matters and why. With better concepts, clearer language and more informed debate, we can build a future in which drones really are our better angels. We can force our politicians and leaders to be more accountable for war. We can understand what is done in our name and what it means for our art, our culture, our politics, our environment. But it's up to us, together, to decide what kind of world we want to witness and to make sure that the technology we build really is on our side. Thank you.